everybody, my name is Drew and I am a psychotherapist here in New York City. And today we are talking about the six subtypes. If you know anything about how I roll, I'm always constantly telling people, you've got to learn the subtypes and you've got to learn three because we are all, all three. We are all, all three. You get it. All of us have within us all three subtypes. You have a dominant and a repressed and hopefully they start integrating and working together for your good. But to get really whole, we need to know how all three of them operate and how they can be integrated into our lives. So that is just me priming the pump here. I've done an overview on the subtypes in general. So go watch that if you don't know much about the subtypes. And please watch the overview of the sixes just to have that 101 course before you move to the 201 course if you're not as familiar with the Enneagram. The sixes are one of the hardest numbers to type. And the subtypes make them look like three different numbers. So the fours, myself included, I am a sexual four. That's one of the subtypes. And you sixes tend to have like these amalgamations that make us look like six different types. And in the sixes case, three different types. So I'm going to try to flesh out how they are different, but we have to just stay in that understanding that fear is a motivator. Forecasting problems, trying to protect ourselves, trying to find security, that idea that anything can, that can go wrong will go wrong has shaped your personality. And for you sixes, fear might be more or less conscious to you. Because there's this spectrum of phobic to counterphobic types. So the, the counterphobic type that goes against fear, if I fear a thing, I'm going to go against it, is going to be less aware of their fear being a motivator. While you phobic types can go, oh yeah, of course, I, I, I'm clearly someone who fears a lot. So it's hard to apply hard and fast rules to sixes, and it's hard to actually give an overview on them because... Until we get to the subtypes to get more specific, it's hard to really identify like which one's which. How do their vulnerabilities create this different type? But the unique thing is that the subtypes are about a primal defense mechanism. Whether I use the group as a social type to get help in life, as I self-preserve, as a self-preserver, to pull back and kind of get the, the resources in life I need to go handle the world, or as the one-on-one -on -one or sexual type to bond with individuals to make sure I feel safe. These are all primal ways of protecting ourselves. If we were at the end of times or this was an apocalypse, uh, you know, one of those movies in which zombies start attacking, which one of those three would be our primary way of feeling safe? But the subtypes are also growth paths. They're, they're ways to understand ourselves more and then start integrating, finding these either opposites or uh, lesser powered subtype versions of ourselves. So in my case, I'm a sexual type, then a self-preserver, then a social. Well, how do I integrate the social more so that I'm not stunted there? But we will hopefully have as our root system here a couple things that you sixes are predicting preparing for worst case scenarios there's a, a vigilance looking for risks and threats and apprehension to move in too quick unless you are that counter type that counterphobic type and you're also really suspicious of leaders and we have to watch, like, how do you interact with leadership? Because it is so important that you have people on your side and are protected by powerful people. You have to scrutinize those leaders to make sure that they can help you be rooted. When we look at these three types, we have to understand that the self-preserver is a bit warm. The sexual type's a bit hot. And the social type is cooler, you know. Uh, there is a, an, an affectionate nature to the self-preserver. 
There's an obedience that the social type has, and there's an aggressiveness that the sexual type has. So hopefully as we unravel this, you'll start to understand yourself better and feel a bit like you have some more control over how you navigate in the world. And that's a real important thing for you as a six, but us in general, is can we know ourselves well enough to navigate the world with some strengths and a concentration on our weaknesses to start integrating strengths of other parts of the Enneagram, other types, other subtypes to help make us more whole. So that's what we're going to do. My name is Drew again. If you're looking for individual help, whether that be one-on-one, -on -one, long-term therapy, short-term coaching, whatever that looks like, get in touch with me. And uh, otherwise, let's go on this journey together. Please subscribe if you're into my content. It helps down the road when I am putting out new stuff. And hopefully there will be more stuff on the sixes down the road. All right, folks, have a good one and stay with me for this journey. All righty. Well, if you've followed me on any of the subtypes before, you know that I like to talk about the counter type first because this is a, a person who usually has a difficult time placing themselves in this number. Whatever that number is, there's always one counter type that doesn't look like the other two because they move counter passionately. So where a lot of sixes can tend to be more phobic or, or pull back, be fearful in an obvious way, the counter type moves against fear. So the, the fear is still the thing that shapes the personality and it's still kind of core to who they are. However, the counter types move against it in a counterphobic way. So what we're going to do is go back to our trusty survival manual, worst case scenario survival handbook to travel, runaway camels, UFO abductions, high rise hotel fires, leeches, and how to survive them. We're going to go to chapter three, page 82, how to ram a barricade. Identify the barricade's weakest points, the side of the barricade or gate that opens, or the place where a lock holds it closed is usually its most vulnerable spot. Some barricades and gates have no locks at all. These are opened and closed by the force of an electrical motor or magnet, which can be overpowered rather than rammed. See below. It tells you below how to do that. Number two, aim at the weak spot. If possible, use the rear of the car to ram the weak spot. Hitting with the front may damage the engine and cause the car to stall. All right. What am I really trying to get across here is the counterphobic six is often looking for the weak spots in others. The weak spots in themselves, they want to kind of find how to compensate by finding the weak spots in others. I share with you guys in the overview how I had that moment in Ukraine where I was living for a year, my friend came to visit, and I had this kind of scam that was pulled on me, and I knew it was a scam, and I puffed up to push back. And that's happened a lot in my life. I have a very counterphobic side, and as a four, a lot of my counterphobia is pushed towards um, psychological issues. If I am afraid to go on a date with an intimidating woman, I'm likely to want to go on that date to really challenge myself. If I feel like there's a moment where uh, I could have a speaking engagement and I'm a bit afraid of that, I'm going to want to challenge myself because I don't like to deal with my fear <laughs> that haunts me. The same for the counterphobic six. So they still live with that idea of Murphy's Law that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And they're still forecasting problems, trying to see what's out there that is an issue to be resolved or um, contemplated to the point of nausea at times. And there is this negative capability that they have to kind of look into the future and find the problem. These perpetual worst case scenarios, as it were. That counterphobic type then does what they fear. There's a conquest, often it's physical. You might see this in extreme sports, in uh, mixed martial arts, UFC, boxing, all of these types of things that go after the thing we're afraid of to make sure we're protected and we advance 
on the enemy. We advance on fear. These types tend to trust themselves, you know? Don't trust everybody else to do what they need to do in a situation to protect me. I'm going to protect me. So I have to get my power ready to keep the enemy at bay. Constantly aware of my surroundings and my environment, watching what's going on. Hypervigilance is still part of them, just like the other two. Scanning. Constantly scanning. So this is that idea that the best defense is a good offense. Now we are constantly on a spectrum from phobic to counterphobic. You sixes are somewhere in there. And because we are all three types, you might be a strong sexual six, but that might be your second highest number. So you're going to start noticing when the counterphobia comes into play, when you start to puff up a little bit. So just notice where you're on that spectrum. You might be on one end where you are really going to go after anything that scares you. Or you might be somewhere in the middle, somewhere at the end, especially if you tend to be in that more phobic category. You guys tend to build a relationship with fear, with risk, with danger. It feels more safe to get close to it, build a comfortable relationship with it in some sense, make friends with it, and then go after it. Now, what the real danger here, and I know this in my own life as a sexual four who can be kind of aggressive at times, is you have to watch about, out about how aggressive you can become how forceful you can become, how intimidating you can be and rebellious you can be. And when we push too hard on fear, we can become our worst enemies, right? That's what the Enneagram teaches us, that our weeds and our flowers are right next to each other, that your weeds grow too big because you're too afraid of looking weak, that you become too strong. And some sexual sixes will have a really hard time even noticing that they are fearful. They're the least likely at times to acknowledge that they're fearful, notice that they're fearful, or admit that they're fearful. So they can even like kind of bypass fear and negate it. And what happens here is that the urgency is louder than the acknowledgement of the fear. The urgency to protect is louder than the acknowledgement of what I feel. There's too much natural selection going on, like the, the survival of the fittest, the dawn of man type shit, where I will, I will break bones if I have to. And I, of course, on this spectrum of female to male, there's going to be different ways in which they might do that. So think about this in your own life, even with your uh, sexual identification. If, if on one spectrum in these binaries, we have like very feminine and then very masculine, where are you in the way you show your counterphobia? How aggressive of a female, how aggressive of a male are you in response to fear? How much do you inflate to protect? How much do you build the body to protect your back? to guard your frank flanks, to, to be strong and disciplined, to make sure you're defending the perimeter. I shared with you in the overview that I had, have, have had surgery in the shoulder because I was picked on pretty relentlessly in, in high school, especially in the middle part of high school, like late freshman year to uh, early junior year. And what happened is, when I got out of high school, I started to inflate my body, build my muscles. And there was a part of me that said, I will not be fucked with anymore. And so the, uh, the awareness of fear was there, but also the awareness of my flanks being compromised, even when they weren't. Thinking that somebody had uh, a intentions that were... Um, malintended to hurt, to maim me, whether that be emotionally or physically, when they weren't even looking in my direction. I just caught a glance and, and projected out something that was very self-protective. 
And then I actually got to the point where I built up my body so much that it started to tear down. That I ripped actual ligaments in my shoulder because I was just working too hard. So be aware of how much you are puffing up to protect. We need to remember that with fear, the six is always looking for inconsistencies. We want all of us to have some consistency in life, but the fear that comes with inconsistency pushes the six to try to find consistencies. And so a sexual six will notice the inconsistencies in the room and start to prepare for them. Because it is, again, we want predictability, we want certainty, we want security, sanity. And it makes us feel a little insane to be in an environment where we don't feel protected. So we have to move towards peace and de-strategizing. <laughs> de-strategizing so we're not always on alert. Now, you might be mistyping. This is common for any countertype. Some of you might mistype as a sexual four. But remember, us sexual fours are wanting to be noticed, wanting to be given attention to be special. It's a different thing for me. Even when I was trying to uh, protect myself in an environment, it wasn't because I was fearful those people were going to hurt me, actually. It was fearful that I wasn't going to be noticed and valued for being something special. In every, almost every fight I have had, it was because I thought the person was devaluing my uniqueness. That they were trying to humiliate me, either with words or with uh, some kind of physical power. But still, the, the pain there for me wasn't that I might not have security physically. It was more so that I was going to be thought of as a chump, as, as somebody that could be humiliated easily. And to me, I'm authentic, unique, smart, sharp. You should know that about me just by looking at me. I know. I've got my issues. I've got to work on them still to this day. So I am in the same camp with you guys. We are working on our shit. Eights, sexual eights. You might mistype as an eight. But remember, they're not that fearful. You guys are looking for security. They're looking for some power and control. Now, of course there's fear in that. Somebody who's looking for power and control has some kind of fear of not having power and control. But it is about like having a step up. Um, yours is a bit more about having security and safety. Eights might actually not be as much of a bully at times as a six. Because a six is hypervigilant where the eight is just an aggressive type. Like they, they might not target somebody. They're just kind of moving in this powerful way and running over people at times, but not spending time bullying that person. They just needed to get past them. So where the eights are a bit more fearless, the sixes have that fear as a core. Many of you sexual sixes consider yourself courageous, and that's not wrong, right? I mean, like, we all have our courageousness-ness-ness-ness-ness in some ways. Um, but some of you are more concentrated on that because of your fear of being in fear. We have to admit to ourselves, moaningly, begrudgingly, that we do have fear as a motivator. So your cognitive hoops that you run through, and remember you're a head type, you're a, you're a thinking hoop guy or gal or they or them, that you have to kind of shift out of that for some peace. I'd actually challenge you to get in touch with your empathy through even art. Something that isn't as primarily powerful looking, maybe is softer. Maybe meditation. I know meditation is almost a remedy to everything, but think about how you might do that and soften yourself a bit. 
take down the vigilance and move towards a place of more natural de-strategizing. For you wing fives, be careful about how you use knowledge to dominate, to be counterphobic with. So that five, right, they're, they're kind of hoarding knowledge and they find pride in it, power in it over others. Well, the, where the six wing five might very much use intellect and knowledge to dominate. So be careful about that too. So hopefully we gave you enough content here to just fill your, start filling your brains with how you as a sexual six are using that counterphobic mentality to handle the world. If this is just one of your uh, subtypes that you're trying to explore to integrate, you might integrate in a healthy way the courageous part of the six. That uh, person who has faith in themselves to handle their business. Because when a sexual six is healthy, they can very much handle their business with a state of peace that is a, com a main component to how they handle the world. Okay, let's move on. Now to the self-preserving sixes. Did you think I would bring up Stockholm Syndrome? Talking about you guys. Gotta go back to the book, the worst case scenario. Chapter two, people skills, how to survive a hostage situation. We turn to page 49 stay calm. Now, many of you guys can actually stay calm in crisis. It's because you've thought so much about it beforehand that when it actually comes, you're ready to go. If shots are fired, keep your head down and drop to the floor. Do not make any sudden or suspicious movements. Comply with all demands. Never look a terrorist directly, at a, at a terrorist directly or raise your head until you are directed to speak. Never challenge a hostage taker. If you are the victim of a skyjacking, you get it. There's a whole bunch of things here, but things to be aware of. Avoid making yourself attractive to terrorists. Try not to take out your passport in public places. Well, <clears throat> some of the problem with the self-preserving sixes is that they do like to make themselves attractive to people in authority positions because it might help them in the long run feel safe and protected. We're going to get to that in the future, but... It is actually a call to you to watch out to be too attractive sometimes. You might attract the wrong people. Still that idea of Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and the Boy Scout model that we talked about in the overview, which is be prepared for the worst case scenario. Self-preserving sixes, like all self-preservers, can be homebodies. They want a sanctuary, a safe place to recoup and revive that is well protected. Now you guys can look a little like twos, but remember your head types, twos are heart types, like myself in the four camp, twos, threes, and fours are heart types. So you guys will go internal more than a two. The two is a bit more externally motivated in helping and protecting others, and they get their worth from being of good use where you are making these relationships with others to protect yourself. So if I can be in good stead with people, then I can, uh, uh, um, in a sense, conspire with them to protect myself. But what can be a problem for you self-preservers, and I think this is where you're on that other spectrum of phobia, where there's the counterphobia of the sexual types is there's endless questions and not a lot of answers. So in many ways, self-preservers can often have good advice for others, but not take it themselves because they get into that intellectual loop of constantly poking holes in their own decision-making process. So they are the most doubting of all the sixes. They doubt their doubts. Like I have a doubt about what I should do and I doubt my doubt about what I should do. And there we go in that circle and we just come back with 10 different answers to the starting point. That gets circular and not linear. So for a three, for example, they're going to move from point to point to point. 
making decisions along the way and trusting themselves in it. Um, but as usual for the sixes, they want certainty and consistency, something predictable, something that feels sensible that can give them some peace. And unfortunately, you're going to have to find that in yourself at some point, especially as you move into middle age, near 40, you're going to realize that this way of doing life without making some of the decisions on my own, without protecting myself and not looking for the authority to protect me, um, if I'm not doing that, 40 to 80 is going to be really rough if I am so gifted to live that way, <laughs> live that long. So there is a search for this ideal protector. And I have to be friendly and good to be around to make sure that I stay in good stead. And what happens is, that's where we almost, I, I brought up that idea of the Stockholm Syndrome, which is, is if you don't know it, when a hostage um, situation happens and somebody takes hostages, it's the idea that the hostages actually start building a relationship with the hostage takers and feel a connection and a protection of them. And this happened in 1973. They, they got this uh, concept from these four hostages that were taken. And when they were rescued by the police, they actually took the side of the hostage takers. Now, it's a kind of a, a more complicated story than that because the police might have done some wrong things. but there was this connection and empathy and compassion for the hostage taker. Now the self-preserving six, the reason I mentioned this is you have to be pretty vigilant about the authorities you pick. You have to have a keen eye and poke the holes there in the ones that will take advantage. The sexual six is likely to say anybody in authority or anybody in power is there because they want to use it in a negative way. They, they want to take advantage of a people. You self-preservers can lean in that zone of thinking that they have your best at heart all the time. And it is a blend. It does require discernment. It's the idea that I don't have the goods to face the world with. So I have to find an authority figure or powerful people to ensure my survival. And I have to be excruciatingly uh, scrutinizing in myself and how I will be perceived, but also try to find those characters that will help me and build alliances with them. And there's almost a fear of abandonment there. You know, as we are trying to find these ideal protectors, ideal relationships, these ideal alliances, there is an insecurity there of can I... Um, maintain these relationships. So what can happen is kind of a, a separation anxiety fear that also comes with it. Now, what does a self-preserving six have to do to ensure these relationships? Well, this is why I was bringing up the Stockholm syndrome is that there needs to be a connection with powerful people. They might smile when they're afraid. Why? Well, it's a good defense mechanism that keeps us from being disliked, from being uh, rejected. If I'm smiling, then I'm saying I'm okay to be with. So there's a softer, more tender side to the self-preserving six. They're more charming and friendly. They need to ensure that contract of alliance. If I look safe to people, they won't kill me, is kind of the mentality internally. I know that sounds extreme, but there is this almost idea, idea of being totally diffused or annihilated if I don't keep strong relationships with people who have alliances with me who will keep me safe. But in the dog sense, we have to put our tail between our legs and shrink from people to not look too competitive, uh, to compete, to not look threatening. So think about this in your life, in your work, in your friendships. Let's just take work, for example, in a corporate structure. You're going to want to resist 
looking like a ladder climber. I'll be a good support. I'll be a good person in the background. I'll build an alliance with you. I'll take you to the next level. Please take me with you. But I don't want to be a threat to your position. Here's my hand. Here's my smile. Here's my warmth. Here's my heart. I give it to you. And the contract is that now we'll kind of take each care of each other. That worst case scenario is still there. You know, the, the contradiction though is if I'm pleasing to people um, and I'm afraid there's some kind of weird contradiction there. Like I'm afraid of losing you, but I, I'm going to be pleasing to you. And uh, it feels really almost dishonest, inauthentic that I'm using you for survival and I'm doing so in a way that is very charming and, and somewhat calculated. Although many self-preserving sixes would never acknowledge that because it's unconscious or subconscious. You're not highly aware of it. So we're just helping you become more aware of it so that there isn't more authentic push. You're drawn to more people who can mutually serve you and that are having your best interests at heart. Remember, you guys are the most phobic of the three types. The most fearful of not being protected. And so that idea that if I am good, I will keep the threats at bay, I will stay protected. But what you hijack is your ability, because you have one, to be angry, to be disgruntled, to push back on authority, to have confrontation and conflict. You work under the assumption that nice is better than good. Let me make a distinction here. Nice is about wanting to be liked. Good is about doing the hard thing to build a relationship. It should hurt you a bit that your survival and being liked are so intertwined. I'd love for you to move towards security in that your heart can connect to another heart and that you can have tension in that relationship to build it. But what this requires you to do is something very difficult for you is to have less of a push and pull with decision making. Because you will have to make a decision to be angry openly to be assertive, to get what you want, to find the right people, not be so dependent, not constantly need to earn relationships, not living with it depends as much as I want, I need, let me build this relationship of trust with you because I'm being authentically connected to my desires. That is my call on you, self-preserving six, sixes. Sorry to be so intense at the end, but damn it, let's get to life here. Start living. Whew, shit. Life is not easy. All right, we're gonna go to our trusty book here, and we're gonna go to chapter four, out and about, how to survive and navigate a minefield. Page 104, simple, ask locals. Explosive ordinance disposal technicians, local women and children are the best sources of information in that order for where danger zones are located. Simply ask, watch the movements of locals. I love this shit, it's wild. It's my last time using this because this is the last number that I'm talking about here. There are subtype, use social sixes. There is a kind of interesting and cool nature to sixes in general. If you ever watched like a move, a sub movie, like a war movie, a uh, hunt for red October when they drop the sonar and it's like beep, beep, beep. And there's an echo location type of situation that's going on to find out where the other subs are or or the typography, topography of, of the ground, uh, 
where they can actually hit a underground mountain or valley. This is what you sixes are doing all the time. You are avoiding the minefields of life. And I think the social sixes have a particularly tricky kind of way that they avoid minefields in corporations, uh, with institutions, and with social dynamics of groups that you are putting out that sonar to just see where everybody's at, what's going on, who to watch out for, who to stay close to. They even have the name the company man or woman at times. This idea of a lifer, uh, somebody who stays, might complain, but still stays, is loyal to the corporation. Team players, the group comes first, community keeps me safe, the community comes first. And there is an exaggerated dependency on this larger group. Similar to social twos, you guys can work from behind the scenes. But you are more inclined to shun the attention than a two. More stealth than a two. Two likes that, that attention for doing what they do. We are those image types in the heart center, the twos, threes, and fours. We want a little attention. Bringing attention on yourselves can make you a target. So you will be more stealthy, more shrewd in how you navigate that world and not bring too much attention to you. You know, the echolocation goes out. What's out there? You don't want people to locate you and go, oh, you're here. So we always have to watch out for this with the sixes is how are they interacting with authorities? How are they bringing authorities closer or pushing authorities wet away? Um, so with you guys, you social sixes, there is an emphasis on being the devil's advocate. But ultimately, you will probably acquiesce and yield to authority. What does the authority say after you've decided to trust them and digest what they give you and you've decided that, like, I can follow this person? Maybe push back a little bit, but now I can, I can use them and build an alliance with them and then we can work together for the social good. So there is this adherence and obeyance, but still that, like, contrarian component maybe not like the sexual six which is a bit more overt but still inclined to possibly take the opposite view uh advocate for somebody smaller and weaker be compassionate kind attentive to those in the room and be present with them and make sure yes there is a duty and loyalty to the bigger corporation or the bigger community or the bigger friend group but still poke some holes and look for some problems. Ask some questions. You don't want anyone to take control fully of your mind and have total authority of you and just become a sycophant. However, there is that yielding to a person that you have decided is good. Now, if you've decided that they aren't, you will demonize them. You will find the ways in which they are harmful and can take a community down. This is a great part of what you guys do. And so we can't steal that away from you, but it can't be too hyper vigilant and take out leaders who are, you know, have their flaws, but are ultimately looking for the good of the community. Here's an affirmation and a warning. You social sixes are still looking for an authority figure to protect you. The answer is still always out there. It might not be intrinsic as much as extrinsic. You know, if you're diminishing your fears by finding the authority, finding the person or the ideolo ideology, the system to protect you, you may not stand up on your own strength as much as you possibly could. The cool thing about the social six though is they're kind of idealistic and skeptical at the same time. They are aware that there are conspiracies 
and inconsistencies and patterns that are inherent in institutions and communities and groups. So while you might become dependent on an authority and outsource responsibility, you can also be more of a person of choice and command. You guys are much more sure and certain than this self-preserving six. Sometimes even too sure. So while you're more certain than those self-preserving sixes, um, you'll still be looking for those characters to guide you. But we have to acknowledge and affirm that you do take often very responsible stances and stand in the place of duty with some certainty. It is to be appreciated. Um, those social dynamics, who's in, who's out, who's dominant, who are, what are the rules here, is something that you can both accept, acknowledge, and to a certain degree idealize, and be skeptical, somewhat resistant, contrarian with, to find out if this thing is running properly. And that really helps a larger group understand how to navigate better. You guys can be traditionalists in the sense. This is that idea of the company man again, or, or someone who is um, religiously or spiritually connected to some kind of consistency, maybe liturgy, or, or the idea of tradition in faith. Here's where you can kind of wrestle a little bit with the ideas of rules and breaking the rules. To not over-identifying with tradition and rules, but also not ignoring them. It's like the Dalai Lama says, learn the rules and know how to follow them so you know how to break them well. Don't get too boring in your acceptance of what this system has while also appreciation for what this system has. It's one of the very cool things about a social six. But like all the other sixes, there's still that concentration on inconsistencies. I want some consistency here. I want to feel safe here. I want to feel secure here. I need some predictability. So that balance between predictability and something new, fresh, that's, that's that part that you guys can wrestle with to help enhance an environment. So that is my, uh, my prayer for you is to go out, not only challenge the system a little bit, but also appreciate traditions and systems so that someone can enter in and have that consistency and predictability. Because we all need that. If life is always twisting and turning in ways that are fast and rapid, and there isn't a slow pace to it, then we could all be discombobulated. And the sixes, and especially you social sixes, are helping us as a community not go too fast sometimes. But also, don't slow us down so much that we can't tweak and shift. That over strategization, whoa, your social scheme, you get it. Woo! and get in the way. So as you, you challenge your own social scheme, while you're challenging the group's social scheme, allow that to be a, both a strength, but concentrate on how it can be a weakness so it doesn't trip you up and trip up the group by staying too stagnant. Cool? All right. I hope you stayed in this for the long haul. Watched all three, because we are always all three. I keep on saying that, but I want to reiterate over and over again. Again, my name is Drew, and thank you for going on this journey with me. Please subscribe. It helps. And hopefully, this has been encouraging to you and also challenging to you. As always, if you want to get in touch with me for individual work, uh, whether that be short-term, long-term, just a one-time consultation, get in touch with me on my socials. And as I say at the end of all of these, Everything is yet to be done. Everything. In the words of Rainar Marie Rilke, one of my favorite writers, 
All right, guys, have a good one, and I've appreciated the time with you.